Isn't that cute? I just love these cartoons. <laughs> I've got a couple in the presentation. They come from an awesome Going bonkers. <laughs> Everyone know the self-help magazine with a sense of humor. It's a, nice, it's a lovely thing to do, have little quick articles on self-help for stressful stuff, right? Uh, anyway, they very kindly said I could use their cartoons and they, uh, they kind of capture the flavor of what I talking about. So, okay. So what I'm going to be talking about is um, anger, just in terms of what it is, that it's not necessarily a bad thing. And, do I need to talk louder? Is everyone actually hearing me? Or I can talk with a mic? Just for the video? The video. Oh, okay. Okay, how's that? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, please, if, if you're not hearing me or I stop making sense, just stop me and I'll kind of rewind and try and do it in English. So, okay. So, I'm going to be talking just about anger as a concept, as a, a very, pri in fact, a primary human emotion and uh, the fact that it's not necessarily a bad thing, but of course, when it creates problems for us, that's when we want to do something different. I'm gonna talk about um, the connection between anger, alcohol, and drugs very frequently, and they are linked in a negative sense, unfortunately. Talking about if your anger is causing a problem for you, what to do, the Anger 101. Um, the steps are simple, it's not always as easy to implement them, of course. And then, of course, the other likelihood is that we're being affected in our life by someone else's anger. And, of course, that, unfortunately, is all too common, too. And what we can actually do about it ourselves, both from the point of view of keeping safe, if it's really the kind of anger that is escalating into violence, or simply anger that is kind of ticking you off because it's really getting under your skin and interfering with your enjoyment of life or your ability to work or something something significant and then the last thing I'll be talking about is what if you try all the self-help stuff the how to manage anger which is one of the options and it's probably the best known one is actually managing the anger that is there and is causing a problem what else can you do and of course that's where I'm going to come in with a plug and tell you about all us wonderful registered clinical counselors and how we can help you deal with it and of course that is one of the things we do and I'm sure many of you here are um, Students from Adler, is that right? Anyone? Yeah, <laughs> gotta be. There. Thank Only you. One, of course. <laughs> so RCC is in the making. Great. Okay. Um, okay. So the good, the good about anger. The first thing is anger is an energy, and although anger generally tends to get a bad rap, the fact that it is an energy means that there's something you could do something with it that could be positive, but not necessarily negative. So there's a lot more likelihood that you can turn anger into action than it is, for example, to turn something like depression into action. It's simply a little bit more energy involved in it. Anger is also an awareness. When you have anger, it tells you there's something going on. Have, experiencing anger is something like the experience you have when you have a stomach ache. It tells you there's something you need to pay attention to. So again, it's not all bad. It can be a red flag that you need to take action in some way. So again, it's about pay attention, do something, figure out what's going on, and resolve it. The other good thing about anger is that it's simply normal. Anger is, uh, is one of the emotions that's hardwired into all of us by virtue of the fact that we're human. So it's not, again, it's not a bad thing. And in fact, if anyone tells you they will get rid of your anger, A, it's probably not true, and B, it's actually not desirable. We should be able to feel anger. It is a potentially useful emotion. So the other thing, and I stand open to correction on this one, I do not believe it's genetic. In other words, people who say, well, I'm angry, my dad was an angry person, it just kind of runs in our family. Yeah, it may run in the family, however, I do not believe it's genetic. And I think, again, um, counselors would agree with me there because it is something that can be changed. So therefore, it's not genetic, even if there may be a genetic component. And the good news about anything that's not genetic is that you have the potential for changing. So, otherwise none of us would have a job, we'd all be doing something else. <laughs> okay, the bad. The bad about anger is of course we can cause harm to ourselves. Harm either because we simply punch a hole in the wall, or when we get mad, uh, we disappoint ourselves, the emotional harm to self. 
emotional harm to others when we shout at someone or name call, whether it's warranted or not, and that's a matter of perception. Physical harm to others is, of course, another risk, uh, another bad thing potentially about anger, and of course, harm to property. So, sure, we, we kind of know about the bad stuff. It can really escalate into what I would call the ugly, the serious damage to health. <coughs> chronic physical health problems can result from chronic ongoing and unresolved anger. So while I talked about the good about anger being, you know, it's an energy, you can do something with it. If you don't do something with it and do something useful, as in put that energy to good use, you can end up essentially damaging yourself. You have that chronic arousal as in the fight or flight instinct, and too much of that, guess what, is gonna cause serious organ damage. You can also cause harm to yourself by chronic suppression of anger. In fact, there's enormous evidence of su chronic suppression of anger, as in I may not be angry, you cannot experience this, predisposing us to serious physical health problems. So, it is not healthy for you to simply have anger that either gets suppressed or gets expressed in a destructive way. So, how do we sit on the balance beam and get it to actually work for us? Um, Serious damage to relationships are, of course, fairly obvious. You know, we yell at people too often. They tend to go away or get mad at us in return. Serious damage to property. Uh, we all know about road rage. It's a very common problem. Guess what? Not healthy for anyone at all. And, of course, it can escalate into problems with the law. So, okay. I want to introduce to you this emotional scale, uh, which was something developed to show the kind of emotions that are pretty much hardwired into all of us. In other words, we can all potentially feel any of these emotions. We can feel them either as a chronic condition, in other words, our general, uh, our default mode, or the way we generally express ourselves. Right? We all know people who have perhaps a very difficult life, and yet they're always cheerful. You know, nothing really gets them down too much. Equally, we know people who seem to be in despair the whole time, even though, on the face of it, their life looks not too bad. Okay, now, as you can see, anger fits somewhere in the middle of that, that scale. In other words, anger is um, a potentially positive emotion. It's also a potentially negative one. Um, but you can see, as I mentioned earlier, how it is an energy. You have more energy with anger than if you have a simply a chronic state of hatred, or fear, or anxiety, or any of those really painful emotions. Why do you have them laid out in such a way? Okay, it's a great question. It's actually a progression from minimal um, energy mm -hmm. to maximal. And actually, what but goes with it too is happiness. If you want to look at the happiness, you could say this is a happiness scale too, because really, people who live in a state of bliss and float around on a cloud all day are pretty much up there at the top, right? For any of us, no matter what our general level of functioning, um, you know, where we, our sort of default mode is, all of us will potentially go up and down the scale depending on what's happening in our lives. The good thing, though, is the higher up the scale we are as our default mode, the quicker we bounce back when we go down. And the longer we stay up. Are we going to get copies of any of this stuff? The stuff is actually copyright, so I don't know. I'd have to actually ask permission to, to hand it on. So, but it's kind of neat, I know. I like it. Yeah, there's actually a huge copy of that in more detail that you can actually purchase from, from and I can give you the reference of where to actually get it. And it's kind of fun to work with, so, yeah, sure. Sorry, can you yeah. just reiterate again why anxiety and fear are at the bottom end of the scale? Okay, it's not to say, you know, in any way evaluate and say someone who's anxious is worse off than someone who is, say, angry. It is simply to say that it's about energy and typically satisfaction, that an angry person may not be the nicest person to be around, but they kind of have more energy and often have more satisfaction in their life than someone who is lower down the scale. Right? So it's, it's really about <coughs> maybe not strictly happiness, unhappiness, but energy would be, um, and, and sense of power to make things happen in your life. That would be another, another side. Okay, so anger, alcohol, and drugs just uh, deserves a mention here. 
Um, anger, uh, alcohol is, of course, a depressant. So while it um, shifts people's ability to judge things accurately, it will generally, it, it can often give expression to anger. You know, it can help people actually say things they might not otherwise have said. However, the likelihood that you actually cause damage with it is, of course, significantly increased. And it's really going to solve it. It's almost like, a, you know, a bit of a, a way of letting off steam, but your potential for damage is, is pretty high there, too. So, um, drugs, of course, depending on what they are, again, are really going to solve the anger. Some people will say, well, you know, if I smoke a joint or two, uh, you know, I actually stop worrying about anything, and therefore I don't get, on it, get into trouble with my anger. Please do not leave here saying the counselor said marijuana is a good thing and solves your anger. It may do for some individuals, but it really is, it's a coping mechanism rather than a solution. So in general, I would not recommend it as such. In fact, excessive drug or alcohol use can be, again, a red flag to say, hey, something's going on here. I need to pay attention. Um, Many drugs, of course, will actually increase anger and predispose people to violence. So generally, again, where there's an excess of substance use, uh, even though usually the primary reason anyone drinks or uses drugs is for relaxation and pleasure, but it can also be very much for stress relief and as a way of dealing with difficult situations. So. Um, again, it's a red flag. People are often appalled when I give them the figure at the bottom there. What is excess of drinking? Let's not even go into anything else. Uh, this is not something I made up. It's the, uh, what used to be called the Alcohol Research Foundation in uh, Toronto, I believe it is, that actually calculates that for a man to drink more than 14 standard drinks in a week and more than two in one 24-hour period is a red flag, and for a woman, we have different metabolism, more than nine drinks in a seven day period, and more than one drink in a, in a 24 hour period. So this does not mean that everyone who exceeds this amount on any occasion is either an alcoholic or has a serious problem. It is merely a kind of potential. So, okay, our topic is anger, not, not uh, addictions. Okay, so, Anger Management 101, probably simpler uh, read than done. However, this is basically what the, the, the process is towards taking control of anger if your anger is a problem for you, okay? So the first is to take responsibility. The acknowledgement actually is the first step. So acknowledging it, in other words, saying, yeah, maybe I've got a problem here. Step one, ask, because that's actually looking at yourself, as opposed to what is commonly done is, well, if you hadn't provoked me, I wouldn't have got mad. Yes, however, you did get mad, and not everyone would get mad in that uh, situation. So taking responsibility for our own emotions is huge. And the great thing about taking responsibility for ourselves in any situation is that when we do, it gives us the potential to change and to make something happen. Whereas if someone else is responsible for our condition, we are essentially a victim because we can't change unless they change. So it's actually very empowering. Even when we're taking responsibility for something like anger, which you know, I really feel ashamed that I yelled at someone or whatever, but if I take responsibility for it, I can change it. As opposed to saying, well, if they weren't so annoying, I would never get angry. Yeah, however, I'm stuck if they continue to be annoyed. So, okay, feel the feeling, choose the behavior. Sounds very easy, yep, right? When I'm about to get into a rage and drive my car terribly fast, I'm not going to be in a position to actually choose the behavior. With anger management, we have to actually anticipate it. That's how anger management essentially works. It's seeing it coming. And what that takes is a lot of introspection and figuring out how does, you know, what sort of thing makes us angry, knowing what the triggers are and anticipating them and having a plan for dealing with them before it actually happens. I often say, and this has zero scientific basis, however anecdotally it really works, is that the more, um, the more emotional we are, as in the more intense our emotions are, 
the less our cognitive brains function. In other words, we think a whole bunch less, clearly, logically, the more emotional we are. In other words, by the time we're into the anger, there's no way we're then going to stop and say, well, this person annoys me, but really I need to take a walk instead. So it is about anticipating it and seeing it coming and taking evasive action as one alternative. So um, the anger diary, oh, okay, before we get there, uh, moderate substance use and unhealthy coping, simply because although that can help you get through at the time, it's really not solving anything. So um, if you to actually really resolve the anger, you're going to have to deal with the substance use or any other unhealthy coping mechanism. So, and when I say that, it could be the fact that I go and exceed my limit on my credit card every time I really get mad at someone. Well, that might be better than yelling at them. However, it really is painful when it comes to the end of the month and I have to pay it, right? So it would be another form of unhealthy coping. Um, identifying the triggers, what gets us going, what is likely to get us mad is huge because it's really facing what is the problem for us. That doesn't mean the problem is that annoying person who has the voice that drives me crazy. It means that for me that is a trigger. So if I take responsibility, I'm saying, this person irritates me. So what am I going to do with it so I don't get myself into trouble? Anger diary is one way of actually figuring out what are those problems. You simply keep some sort of record. You don't have to write reams and reams about what happened every day, but simply keep a record of what is your mood and what happened today. And it's, it's, again, it's a way of looking inwards and figuring out what is it that's driving this problem anger for us, right? Okay, the coping strategies, there's a thousand and one of them. Time out is one that is best known, which is basically the, you know, count to 10, walk away do some deep breathing, go for a walk, don't have a drink, and come back when you calm down to deal with the situation. In other words, simply take a break from it as opposed to keeping going. Uh, Self-soothing, anything you can do that is kind to yourself, that is gonna calm you down, and it is not gonna actually cause harm to you or anyone else, or even to property with luck. So um, avoidance as in avoidance of the trigger. If you have an option that the traffic drives you crazy and you can leave half an hour later or earlier, well, you know what? You've avoided a problem. And that is managing the anger. So, um, distractions, something else you can do. So, you know, your annoying co worker, I have a client who's doing this right now. Uh, the co workers drive her crazy because they sit and chit and chat out the whole time. So, she got permission from her boss to wear headphones. She doesn't hear them. She gets on with her work, problem solved. So that's avoiding, uh, you know, avoiding uh, using a distraction. Exercise is an awesome technique for dealing with any excessive, unwanted, negative emotion because it actually utilizes our body to actually work it out. So it's it's a wonderful channel for where you know getting rid of a lot of excess. Now all of these techniques are simply management tools. They are not resolving anything, but they sure as heck can make life livable and keep us out of trouble in terms of um, the anger getting, getting, getting the better of us. So point eight um, is important because what I'm wanting to draw your attention to there is that suppression of anger is not a solution either. And I've touched on that already. And the point, oh, yeah, at you bet. Anyone else needing, needing a handout? No, that's the, well, you can take, actually take that too. That's, if, that's what you say whether you like this or not. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> needing one? I'm sorry, I think I'm just about out of them too. But if anyone's <coughs> missing, let me see if I've got another one. Sorry. I thought I'd got lots of extras, but. Okay, yeah. I'll give you one in bits and pieces. Anyone else? Everyone got something? Okay, great. I've just got the cartoons. So that's a nice part. So. Okay. Um, okay. Healthy expression, not suppression. Simply meaning that when we have anger, it is good to express it in some way. In other words, do something with it as opposed to simply stuffing it down. Because the suppression, again, is going to lead to the same sort of health problems as 
expression in a, in a, in a, a violent or excessive way. So we're, we're sort of do, doing a, a tightrope walk, and that's why I talk about the feel the feeling. You know, know what's going on for you. It's okay to be angry. What's not okay is to cause ourselves or others damage. So it's a matter of feel the feeling, choose the expression. Okay. So, and and um, yeah, the self-monitoring, just checking how you're doing, the emotion diary. Again, it doesn't have to be a big deal. How did I do today? Mm, calm, except in traffic. Okay, that's it. It's just checking in with yourself so you know what's going on and you are managing your own situation. Okay. Number 10, the identify and address life stresses. Obviously, um, you know, that's desirable in any circumstances if we're unhappy in any way, including excessive anger. It's a good thing to kind of review what's happening in our life generally to see is there something that is just kind of cranking up the stress on me which of course means we're more likely to experience unwanted negative emotions of all sorts. And if there is something we can deal with in any way, you bet it's gonna make it easier. That's part of the anger management. And then, uh, I'm gonna misquote this, but I know there's that lovely old saying of, um, you know, what's it, give, give, excuse the, the religious connotation. God give me the courage to uh, I, you know, to change the things that can be changed, you know, and right, right, right. serenity, okay, and the wisdom to know the difference. So to figure out what can we change, accept that which we can't, and just essentially go with it. Okay. Okay, so that's a, a really, yeah. Just a question. Yes. What you're talking about makes so much sense. Would you apply that to, uh, let's call it, low grade irritability? You know, people that um, you can tell they're aware that they can get angry mm -hmm. or they've had anger problems in the past, and now you notice that uh, they're sort of trying to contain it, but it still comes out as tension and irritability um, more often, let's say, than would be considered average or normal. Right. Yeah. You raise a really good point, and that's when we notice this in others. Now, my take is that it's really not for us to say to someone else, you know what, I think you need to do something about it. So it's more that what I would really like is for each of us to kind of take responsibility for ourselves. So if I'm finding I'm excessively irritable, then you bet that all of this would apply. You know, kind of what's going on, what, you know, what is it that's driving this? Is that's like that low grade suppression. Yeah, well, well, and I think what you're describing is anger that's perhaps been toned down a bit, but it really hasn't gone away. And I think that's a great illustration of, yeah, it's not going to go away just because you said, can't do this, this is my boss, you know, really. It might help, but it's, then we go home and kick the dog instead, right? Because oh, it's, it's still going to be there. <laughs> oh, I don't kick my dog, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, it's, in other words, it doesn't actually go away. It is there, and our bodies know. So for sure, we need to attend to, to anger, no matter how it's manifesting. And really the criterion is, probably a good point, time to mention it, is, do you remember the emotional scale I said, where, where we looked at anger is a normal emotion, and the fact that we're able to be angry is not a problem. What is a problem, and the part that we probably want to either manage or change, is where it's excessive anger. In, and what is excessive? Well, that's our call, and sometimes it's society's call. What is excessive? And my belief is that the excessive anger, as all other negative emotions, are acquired through life experience as opposed to genetic. So, and that's where the stress reduction needs to come in in order to get rid of whatever that excess is. So it's appropriate to feel a bit angry when someone does us harm. You know, if I could go home to, my, home to my house tonight and find someone's broken in, yeah, I'll be mad. But I will not go around screaming and shouting and run after the person with a baseball bat. Um, but I would be mad, it would be appropriate. I, it's a violation. So it's useful to feel that feeling, but then I'm choosing the behavior, which is call the police, call, call the insurance, you know, in other words, deal with it in a, in a constructive way. Does that answer your question in a roundabout way? It does. I just, um, so I can assume that what you're talking about the real anger, most, 
also applies to, let's say, irritability that ebbs and flows. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Just tends to have perhaps lower grade, you know, consequences. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's let's turn to what if the problem is not your own anger, but the anger of someone else. And I'm going into the first into the most extreme form of anger, anger where in fact you are actually scared of this person. And whether it's your neighbor, a family member, your boss, a co-worker, um, ang extreme anger that is expressed in a violent way is harmful. Ironically, not only to the person on the receiving end, but also to the person actually dishing it out. Okay? So verbal abuse, even though it is often downplayed, can be extremely destructive in more insidious ways than physical violence. Physical violence, of course, includes even things like intimidation and control. So, um, abuse clearly harmful to our personal well-being, to our self-esteem. In fact, verbal abuse is the more more um, dangerous of the two in terms of bringing us down because it's kind of subtle and it's explained away. If you weren't say irritating, I wouldn't yell at you, right? So. Um, abuse is certainly harmful to our physical health, the same reason as anger is. Uh, you know, the, it, it brings out this physiological response to essentially danger. And at a chronic level, it is going to undermine our health, and most certainly our emotional health. Um, witnessing abuse is most definitely harmful to children's development. And when I say witnessing abuse, I'm not just talking about actually seeing dad hit mom. I'm talking about being aware that within the home there is this kind of tension and anger going on. It's not directly, even indirectly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So people who say, well, we never fight in front of the kids. Well, not that's even, good. That's a thought. Maybe not even children, just like even just casual people um, in, a, yeah, in, a, in an environment. Yeah, absolutely. And again, if you think of, say, in the workplace, if you have colleagues who are going at hammer and tongs with each other verbally, well, you bet, you've got a stressful workplace, right? So we're all very much affected by what is happening around us, even if it's not directly aimed at us. And what do you mean by undermining health? Oh, simply that it is damaging to you to chronically live in a state of fear and tension. So again, you're going to be secreting the, you know, your cortisol and all those other hormones that are excessively there. And Deb, Deb knows all about this, right? Um, so, so you know, that's not the way we're actually intended to function. We, we're having the kind of reaction in our body that is intended only to be there on occasion. Can you talk about those chemicals again? Okay. Now you're going to have, you know, have me, have me. Uh, Call me on it. Cortisol is, is, is the first one, and then, you know, adrenaline. Is it adrenaline that turns into cortisol? So cortisol stimulates your adrenal glands. Okay, which then releases the, yeah. So I imagine that for an elderly person who's mm. the victim of chronic insidious verbal abuse or physical abuse, and who also is dealing with, um, say, heart disease or something, that would really be extremely serious. Yes, absolutely. The question was about an older person who's already dealing with perhaps physical health problems and then perhaps also suffering abuse would be extremely Could harmful. Could that potentially shorten their lifespan? I would think so, yeah, absolutely. Because after all, what you, what you have is, you know, it's not only the physical indicators of it, but the, you know, the fact that emotional abuse actually brings us down in terms of our self-worth, our feeling valued. Do you know that there's a lot of evidence that healthy relationships will promote longevity and health? So in fact, I think there's a, research has been done on recovery from things like surgery, serious burns, and the presence of a healthy relationship in your life is a greater predictor of how fast you'll heal than the medical indicators are. Now that does not mean you have to have, you know, a lovey-dovey, one-on-one, intimate relationship. It simply means a person or people in your life who care about you. So close friendships, supportive colleagues, anyone. Supportive relationships are very nurturing for us. And, and equally, the opposite is destructive relationships are very damaging. 
Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, how to keep safe. Um, the first one is actually simply to regard yourself as deserving to be kept safe and away from abuse. And that's a, ironically re relatively hard to achieve if you are in an abusive situation. Because of course that one of the parts of, of abuse is that it simply peels away at your self-esteem. So if you can grasp back the value of yourself, in fact one of the ways of doing it, if one is in that situation, is to say, if what was, is happening to me was happening to someone I cared about, would I be okay with this? And of course the answer is no. So, okay, then it's not okay for it to be happening to me. So valuing yourself is the first step towards actually taking action. Valuing your children, and most people in this situation absolutely do value their children, but it's to value them to the point where you can actually take whatever steps you need to to protect them. Valuing the angry person, I popped that one in there, it's a bit weird, but really what it is saying, if we set limits with someone who is, whose anger is causing harm to us, and if we're able to do it safely, you are actually, in a way, helping them, because you're letting them know you crossed over the line and I'm not going to let you do that. Is that making sense? No. Okay. No. Okay. Should I try it again in English? Well, you're valuing them, and this may not be your prime intention, but you're essentially, you're, in, you're trying to draw out of them the kind of healthy behavior that... So I value how, however I'm not going to... Oh, you're not tolerating. No, not at all. But you so, value the relationship. Like you value the person, but you don't tolerate the behavior. You got it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Protecting yourself and your children, absolutely essential. Number five, don't accept promises of change without evidence of change. And this is one of the traps that people fall into is, well, you know, I'll, I'll never do it again. And, well, of course, we give the person another chance. Their intention may be 100% to never do whatever it is again. However, unfortunately, the chances are that it will happen again. So what you want is to see change happen in order to allow that person to continue to be part of your life and to be, be in your world. So telling others who are safe is, is one of the first ways to get help. And to, uh, when I say others who are safe, I mean other people who will not harm you. So whether, again, it's friends, co-workers, family, neighbors, letting people know what's going on. People often don't want to because they feel ashamed. You know, I must have done something wrong to be treated this way. It's not anything any of us would like to have happen. However, reaching out to others gives us the strength to say, well, you don't deserve it. I'll help you. Call me if you need it, right? Um, and. Uh, so the setting boundaries, as in what's okay for you and what's not okay, uh, is really important too. The how to do it, I'll talk a little bit more about it. So, yeah, I think it's a really a fascinating thing. Just um, I work in addictions and, and with an addictive partner, using that other their substance, you know, the escalation. It all kind of works yeah. in, in the same way. But it's a good uh, test against the relationship to value yourself. Absolutely. Because, you know, one partner might be in the other one and might still be in the same. Yes. I can see this working quite well with that. Great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, little, the little handout I've given you is quite nice for this too, conceptually, the one, the, the picture with two people on it at the back, because it's really saying, it's emphasizing what I talked about earlier about for each of us taking responsibility for ourselves. So even though we are all social creatures and we live in relationship with various other people, it's saying that for each of us, we're responsible for how we feel, how we act to others. In other words, we're pretty much responsible for everything. Equally, we would like the other person to be responsible for their stuff too. And the setting the boundary is saying, I take responsibility for me, I expect you to take responsibility for you. Person has a different way of dealing 
with anger, um, how obligated are you to the person that you're with? As opposed to like just you're dealing with the person, the third person, right? Like you team up, we say, see ya, I'm running, uh, you're on your own, you know, this kind of thing. Like I find situations like that where I'm dealing with the anger pretty much how you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But as I'm moving away from the dangerous situation, my friend is still sitting there going, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> you know, and I want to sort of go, this kind of thing. Like, you would be talking about that at all? It's sort of a like group thing. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so. Okay. I think maybe a sort of quick, my quick response to that would be ultimately I believe each of us is responsible for our own well-being and our, our response to a, a, you know, a dangerous situation as you've described. However, if I'm there with my friend, like you, I'm going to be saying, hey, hey friend, how's about we get out of here? You know, it's sure, we, you know, depending on the relationship, we may want to provide support, direction, encourage people to essentially handle the situation the same way we do. You know, if our child is there, a small child, you bet we're going to be saying, hey, kiddo, we're out of here, right? Does that answer? Yeah. Okay. Did you have a question there? No, oh, I was just wondering about um, forgiveness and how, how the angry person can forgive themselves after they've already caused serious damage mm -hmm. to their loved ones, after yeah. they've already you know, caused the abuse. Great question. Thank you. How does the and of course, the, yeah. sorry, no, no finish your question. Sorry, um, in a relationship, for example, where the angry person was interestingly the only person who took responsibility, whereas the the other person took no responsibility. Yes. So then it became even more difficult for the angry person to. Right. Yes. yes, absolutely, and I don't know if you all heard that. The question was about a situation where you have someone who's feeling bad because they've done certain bad behaviors when angry. They have taken responsibility, they're trying to repair it, but the person that they have wronged is not willing to accept that. Now, okay, let me back up. There's a few things I can say about this. One is first question you had was how does an angry person forgive themselves for what they've done and I would say that once we take responsibility for what we've done that is the first step towards forgiveness because it's saying I did this I don't like this about me I'm going to take steps that I don't do this again and if possible I will take steps to repair the damage I've done with someone else part of that acceptance is also understanding that for each of us when we do something Whatever it is, whether we you know, do something in an angry outburst or anything else, we're doing the best we can in the situation because that's all there ever is. We're doing the best we can. And sometimes our best yeah, makes us cringe afterwards. Okay, hopefully it's not the end of the world, but it is a matter of accepting. At the time, it seemed like a good idea and move on from there. Plenty of space for improvement. Can I come to you in a sec? I'm just. Oh, yeah. I think there was another part to it. Was what do you do with a person who won't accept that, that apology? Yeah. You know, I or, think or it's. Else, a, or else, I guess more appropriately put, that the, the, the person who is the recipient of the anger themselves does not normally take responsibility for their own part, which right. feeds the anger. Yes. Sure, and you, you know, so yes, well. absolutely. You know, there's, there are always going to be people who will not take responsibility for their behavior. That's, that's the easiest thing in the world, is to find people who are not taking responsibility. They are bound. Um, and my, my re recommendation would be, don't get stuck on that. Because those people are, you know, walking their own path, doing what they have to do, and we can, we can change them. I'll talk, actually, I am going to talk a bit about it, how we can handle things in relationship, but at the end of the day, it's their job. All we can do is take responsibility for ourselves and say, because you're angry and I can't live with someone who's being angry, I am going to, I'm not going to call you next week. You know, in other words, set our own boundaries to take care of ourselves. 
and the other person will make their choices accordingly. Are you, that, does that answer it? Okay. You had I a just, question. I yeah. just want to go back again, like in the beginning of the anger, and as far as like to my idea of what it, it really is and what precedes it is like shame, guilt, remorse, a sense of loss, a sense of something taking something from you, and that's why people originally, like in your scale, I didn't, I didn't see any of those kinds of feeling words. And I'm wondering if maybe if there's a piece missing. Okay. Because um, I think people get angry, but they, underneath all of that anger, there's really valid reasons why people get so angry. For sure, for sure, yeah. And I mean, the scale is not considered, you know, this is all the human emotion there could be. This is just generally what, it, what are the broader, more the primary human emotions. There's a gazillion others, and so for sure. fear based, right. Absolutely, yeah. And often anger is, the, it, it's kind of like the front man for all sorts of really harsher emotions, fear, shame, as you say, all yeah. those, absolutely, yeah. Not to say that those aren't there at all, but what we're dealing with is what is when it manifests as anger. And if we're doing it, in a way, to me, anger management is like the, the, the first response. You know, okay, we, we want this to stop causing harm. So it's sort of damage control. We do that first. The next step for me would definitely be try and get rid of it altogether. And there actually are ways of doing it. That's the good news. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Okay, so how, how do we actually go about setting boundaries? The first step is really, all relationships are ongoing negotiations, all relationships at all times, about what's okay and what, what's not okay. So the first thing to do is simply let someone else know what you want. So in terms of anger, and uh, again, actually draw your attention to the other uh, little part of the handout, the little, dear little cartoons that give you an example of how to do it not such a good way and how to do it in a better way. Um, so you, you want to ask someone for what you need. So the person is raising their voice and this makes you, creeps you out because you start getting scared. You want to be able to say to them, not, you know what, you're raising your voice, just tone down there. Because they'll probably say, what do you mean I'm not? Right? In other words, you'll get a reaction from them. Whereas if you can say, I'm sorry, I, t I tend to get freaked out when someone raises their voice at all. Would you mind just calming it down when you talk to me? That would help me a lot. And you see that I'm much more likely to get a response that, okay, okay, I've got to talk down when I talk to you, as opposed to getting a reaction, which means I won't get what I want. So the first step is to simply let the other person know what you need and to own it ourselves. That's the ask so that others can hear. Um, accept that other people will not always give us what we want. For sure. It just isn't part of the deal. Doesn't matter who they are and whether they love us or not, doesn't mean they're gonna do what we want them to do. And there's a hundred and one reasons so it doesn't really matter what it is. But what we want to do is just realize that this is the way it is. So the example that um, the person in the back row raised about the angry person who's taken responsibility, apologized, and the other person isn't accepting their part at all. Well, that's a classic example of someone who's not stepping up to the plate and saying, well, yeah, I realize I asked you at the wrong time. I know you're always tired when you come home from work, so what did I do? I bugged you. They're not taking responsibility. So all we can do is accept this is the way it is. We've asked, so you ask for what you want, except you may not get it. So what are you gonna do about it? There are a couple of things we can do. One is, well, that's it. It's one of those things I can change. I'm gonna live with it. There's usually something different we can do. And if it's in relation to that person, we can let them know. Well, look, I'm sorry if you don't tell me that you're, not gonna, that you're coming home for dinner, I'm not gonna cook for you, right? It's a consequence, and we're letting them know. We're not saying, you are so inconsiderate, I'll never talk to you again, I'm never gonna cook for you again. We're simply saying, I'd like you to let me know when you're gonna be coming home from dinner, for dinner. But if you don't, if you don't tell me, I'll assume you're not, okay? That's it. So we're doing it in a nice way, but we are actually setting a boundary, and we're saying, this is what's okay, instead of just getting mad as heck and giving the person heck and telling them that they're inconsiderate we simply set those consequences, if that's okay. And then that gives the other person a choice. First time there's no dinner, then I say, hmm, 
Maybe I should have just put in that little word, right? Okay. Um, more about other people's anger stressing us out. Accommodating someone's anger is what we're often inclined to do. In other words, oh, just walk away and don't worry, let them shout at me. The problem is it can solve the problem in the short term. It's not going to solve it in the long term. In fact, it's again, it's allowing that person to think that this is okay. So while you may not want to stop them right then and there, you may want to go back to them after and say, you know what, that really upset me and I'm not okay with that. So I just want you to know that if this happens again, this is what I'm going to do. Because then you're setting a boundary and you're actually, you're not simply allowing this to happen. Because unfortunately, even though we hope the person was just mad that time and it won't happen again, chances are it will. If we've essentially said, this is okay, right? Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about two other topics, or two specific areas of set boundary setting. One is when we're talking, working with someone who is dependent on us, so a young child, um, so or someone we're responsible for. So say, you know, like an employee that you're responsible for. You have a different relationship than with someone with whom you have an equal relationship, and equally, a very different situation when you are a de you are the dependent person and you're dependent on someone who is angry. So your way of setting boundaries and keeping yourself safe is going to be very different depending on what the relationship is. You have different possibilities. Um, if you are the, the in fact, your possibilities become more limited if you are a dependent person. There are, however, always options, and your option is most likely to be able to reach out to someone else for help, right? I can talk a bunch more about that. Is yeah. that like elder abuse is becoming more yes. in the news, more talked about? Yeah. But they're afraid of speaking out at the same time because their caregivers might punish them. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I think it's actually a really healthy sign in our society that we're actually acknowledging elder abuse and recognizing it as, a, as an issue. Yeah, so I mean, that's again a very typically, you know, a vulnerable population, a vulnerable group of people uh, with limited resources. Um, I think, you know, our awareness as a society is huge. That's the first step. And certainly, I, I think it behooves any of us who have uh, older family members who perhaps are in care because they need, need that care to be very aware and to know what the signs of abuse are so that we can do our part towards actually simply reducing it or even better to be able to get rid of it all together. So, yeah, so call it, call it where it is. It's interesting actually, with something like elder abuse, um, it's probably quite similar to... Um, what are the signs of elder abuse? Wow, wow, that could be a, a topic on its own. You know, a lot of it is to notice change. You know, it's the same as looking for, for signs of substance abuse. Sudden change in behavior, sudden change in, in presentation. Certainly physical abuse signs are relatively easy to spot. Complaints, uh, in fact, that was actually the point I was about to make, is, you know, when, when a senior is, say, complaining about, you know, the mean whoever caregiver, I would really want to check it out and not just say, oh, you know, this person moans about everyone. Maybe they do maybe there's a good reason for it. So in other words, you know, take it seriously, don't discount it, don't assume that it's true, but see what you can do to actually check it out. So it's, you know, I think a lot, of, a lot of the problems we can actually spot by simply being aware and being open to possibility. Not to jump to conclusions, but to kind of keep an eye open for things. The short, short version of it. I know I've got a, yeah. Okay. 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 Back to our, my favorite cartoon. If the manager, if this is back to if your own anger is a problem, um, actually, if someone else's anger is a problem to you too, and doing the kind of um, things that I've suggested have not been sufficient to resolve it, reaching for help from family and friends, uh, doing what you can to set the boundaries. 
If that's not enough, professional help, we, that's what we do. We, do we, we offer that help, and we can walk you through that difficult time. I want to just mention briefly that um, apart from we have 2,600 registered clinical counselors in BC, I believe that's the right number. There are a lot of us people specializing in different areas, and certainly counseling can, can be a really good way to get you through a difficult situation. I want to just mention though that one way that I have found of dealing with excessive anger, as that's our topic tonight, is an, a, a counseling modality called applied metapsychology, which is a mouthful, but that's what it's called, meaning to go beyond psychology. And the, t the approach we have is one which allows us to get rid of those acquired secondary emotions. In other words, the anger that is not genetic, it's not there because you're a person and you're able to feel anger, but you've acquired it through life experience, be it trauma or simply negative life experiences. And this is one thing you do need to do with a counselor, but you can actually, it's got sort of like peeling an onion. You take away the layers of it, and it's actually quite awesome to do. So when, when I actually advertise that I do anger management, but when someone comes in and says, hey, you know, I've got an anger problem, blah, 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 I'll say, well, I can teach you anger management, or I can help you get rid of it. And, and it'll take you about the same amount of time. So generally, of course, people will opt for, why, why have to work at managing it when you can actually get rid of it? And it is a relatively simple way of dealing with that, that, that pain, and it does actually disappear, and people will say, um, I haven't actually got mad the last couple of weeks. Uh, what happened? You know, so it can feel really strange because suddenly something that was always there is suddenly gone. But of course, that's generally what we can achieve with counseling. So, um, okay, I think that's about it, what I have to say. Thank you for your time and attention. I'm